Welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. And I'm Reed. And uh, Reed, uh, I'm actually impressed with myself this year. I don't usually remember Valentine's Day, but it must have been a month ahead of schedule. I was like, hey, there's something coming up, isn't there? And uh, you were talking about doing something about, I don't know, doing some stuff that was off topic, more pop culture-y than like you know, all the ad stuff we've been doing. And so it just connected that we thought, let's do an episode on things we love that non-related to, to ad ads or uh, or apartments. So we turned it into this episode where we're going to have a few guests on. Well, to be totally honest about it, uh, we were n- n- delayed on our on our efforts to try and get those year end recaps for the pop culture. And then uh, it connected with you. So I'm giving you credit here that, hey, we still could do this, but let's turn it into a passion thing and, you know, slap it on top of Valentine's. So I thought it was great. No, I'm just I'm giving you credit and also being <laughs> Is this a backhanded here. slap? Are you are we blaming me that we didn't get it done no, for the no, year no, in no. recap? No, no, not, at, <laughs> not at all, man. I have every bit the ownership. I'm just saying we I feel like it was because the staff didn't jump in as quick as we thought they would. And that you know, because you repositioned instead of like recaps of the year of streaming or music or whatever, uh when we went to the well with uh you know, uh, what are you passionate about? You got a lot more people raising their hands. So, right. Yeah. yeah. It all worked out. It all worked out. It did work out. Uh, so, um, this is the most people we tried to record in one day and also the most, uh, yeah, I guess the most one after the other, we got a little bit off. So, uh, we had some technical difficulties as people jumped into their recording kind of like mid session, but, um, we're going to talk to Grace about her, uh, her love for her new goats. <laughs> we're going to talk to Greta about uh, being her hobby as a trapezist. Or is that what you would call that? A trapezist? Trapeze artist. Trapeze artist. Not a trapezist. <laughs> uh, and we're going to talk to. doesn't sound good for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I used it. <laughs> we're going to talk to Steve about his escape room uh, that he owns or or his escape room business that he owns. Uh, Katie about Harry Potter and and uh, the artist work there. And then, you know, we wrap it up with Noah and uh, roasting your own coffee beans. But man, I learned so much, Reed. I feel like, um, I think we've talked about this before, but you know, Bezos, like when they go, uh, when they go through hiring at Amazon, he tells them to look for people that have different, like unique backgrounds, things that are different. So the example they always give is that at Amazon, if you're, if you were a professional ballerina, you have a higher chance of getting hired, you know, than if you have that marketing degree. And now that we've gone through this, I'm like, hell, man, we've done a really good job of bringing people on that are have their own ballerina going on. Yeah, I, that's a nice way, I guess, getting there for that point. I was going to say it in a different way, uh, less interesting. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, the the just, yeah, bizarre, like, skills and passions that we we had unearthed i don't think it stops there i think these were just the courageous ones i guess that that were willing to get on with us but um you know we talked about and you're of course a runner but you know lurch has said that to me many times he's like you know you look for people that um you like marathon like you know trail runners you know whatever those are always good hires uh people that have sports backgrounds this kind of stuff and I feel like that's kind of old school now. And this may be like the new school. And Amazon obviously doing it is a great example, but where it's like you're not necessarily looking for a marathon runner. You're looking for somebody that shows an immense amount of passion and focus in, in, in various areas, you know, like of life, right? That they love. And that's what we got. Um, and all these people have been wonderful hires for us. So uh, it, all, it all makes sense. So, Reed, go back to your 25 year old self you're interviewing for a job, what would be the passion that you would have been trying to communicate? (laughs) I'm just saying. It wouldn't have been a, no, it's a fair question. I could ask you the same and you're probably gonna have a better answer, but mine wouldn't have been a trapeze. It wouldn't have been goats and it wouldn't have been roasting coffee. Um, It would have been writing. um, And I wasn't that far along with it. And it's not as easy, like, you know, to get somebody, like if you were to put me, uh, onto the podcast, I, I wouldn't have sounded near as interesting as, as they all did. But, um, 
you know, I, I was doing short stories and stuff like that. And I, you know, it started my blog. So if you had caught me in my late twenties, I would have been pretty far into sales smack, you know, uh, which was pretty fun. So that's what you would have gotten for me. Yeah. And I think that's a good one. Like, uh, I don't, I think it would depend at what point in my life you got me. I still don't know that I would have raised my hand like these folks and had something this quirky. Um, but obviously both of us are passionate people. So it's, but it's funny to me that we didn't have like something far afield as a passion that we were like, well, you wouldn't believe that I'm into X, Y, or Z. Uh, so whatever, I guess we're not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, um, I don't know if what it is, you know, if it had anything to do, I mean, I was, you know, passionate about, uh, you know, frankly, the, 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 you know, now my better half, um, you know, so <laughs> spending a lot of time, uh, you know, with Miranda and, you know, I'm an exercise junkie. I know you are too. So, uh, you know, your running obviously has taken off or did during that stretch, but, you know, there was clearly things, I mean, neither one of us were sitting around watching TV all day. I mean, uh, so it is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, uh, these, these are far more, <laughs> far more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah, this is a little bit off, uh, off topic episode. Uh, but if you enjoy it, let us know and we'll do some more of them, but I really uh, had fun getting to know these people and some of their passion projects on the side. Yep. No doubt. Okay, we're here with Grace Harrison. She's one of our account coordinators um, at Digital. And Grace, we brought you on to talk about the thing you love. I, I just assumed you love love these, but you have goats, or your family has goats. Yes, we have goats. It definitely started with having goats and then turned to loving goats. I didn't really think much of goats until we suddenly had them, I'd say. But love them yeah. now. So tell us the history. Like, how How did you not love goats before you got them? And now they've grown on you. Yeah, definitely. So I think to understand the goats, you have to understand the farm. So I'm from St. Louis, <laughs> Missouri, um, which is definitely St. Louis. It's very suburban. Um, but we have a farm out about an hour and a half away um, in Missouri, which is definitely rural land. Um, so we don't live on the farm. We just share it with my dad's side of the family. So um, we grew up just going out there to play. It's definitely a pleasure farm rather than a purposeful farm. We don't grow anything. We don't sell anything. Um, we've just always had some horses up there and then we just have a bunch of land. So just drop on mud boots, get out there and play on the weekends type thing. Um, but obviously as we've all grown up and kind of moved away from St. Louis, um, we don't go there as much, but my aunt um, and my cousins, they have gone there a lot more during quarantine. Um, obviously it's a great place to retreat to. So I don't really know exactly how the goats came about. Uh, the best way to describe it is I feel like during COVID people have had some like COVID crises, kind of like midlife crisis where they just do things kind of without really thinking. And I think the goats is kind of ours. So suddenly just got a text one day that we had bought three pregnant goats at the farm. So they were up there with our horses. I think it was like 200 bucks a pop. Um, and they just kind of existed. Yeah. Well, Reed, um, we just talked about it was your birthday. So are you about to go through a crisis and pick up a, a pregnant goat? I've been through several crises, but uh, a goat has never entered my mind as like a solution for those. But you know, maybe <laughs> I've just been you know, in the dark this whole time, <laughs> um, you know, therapist, what, what do you need a therapist for when you have goats? Um, you said Missouri, is that a catch all for like urban Missouri? Or, I'm sorry, uh, rural Missouri, or is that actually like somewhere I could find in a map? No, that's, that's just what we like to call it. Yeah. <laughs> it feels okay. very different than St. Louis. So yeah. we, we like to call it that. All right. Well, $200 a pop seems like a bargain. I mean, when you look at the price, <laughs> granted a cow's like five times the size, but you know, I, I that sounds like a steal, especially if they are pregnant. Yeah, totally. So they actually do have some purpose as well. Um, when we originally got them, the first thing I thought was like goat milk, goat cheese, let's do something with them. Um, but actually one of the benefits is 
10 goats. So they're Tennessee fainting goats. So they actually do faint and get stiff legs when you scare them, um, which is <laughs> kind of sadly funny. Um, but actually 10 goats of that breed can clear an acre of land in a month. So their favorite foods are poison ivy, uh, honeysuckle, and I think vines. And we have a bunch of poison ivy at our farm. So I don't know if that's just the excuse we we give to why we actually bought them, uh, but they actually do have purpose. So people can like rent out goats to clear their land or to like mow their lawn. Um, so they do something. <laughs> My sister's well, uh, what, boss what? does that actually. He, uh, I was going to ask you about renting the goats, but he has like a herd. I think he's got like twenty goats. I see. But you're multiplying, so you'll get there in no time. Oh yeah, we're multiplying. We're at seven now. So <laughs> you <away>. said <laughs> you said you said ten does an, uh, can do an acre in a day. In a month. In a month. Oh, a day a would be yeah. Okay. Great. Holy cow! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I had that mistaken. Yeah, so it's uh, going to be a pretty incestuous like group that you got there, like as they multiply. <laughs> yeah, well, we're working on that now. So the three pregnant females, obviously, are all females, but where my cousins out there living, dealing with all of the, you know, how to secure the little ones, get them, get them good to go. But they're pretty funny. They don't really do much. They just kind of jump around. We get videos of them going down slides. Slides. Hanging out with each other. Yeah, we have like a little play set and they, they do that. But well, do they? Uh, I forget. Is it bleat? Like, what's the what's the sound that a goat makes? Bah. No, I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate I, you actually sounding it out for me. I. I think it's there bleeding. A name like for like a dog. Yeah, I think it's bleeding. I, you know, yeah, dog it's better when you actually. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is. That was classic. We're going to have to grab that piece of audio and use that as a drop for sure. Um, so what about the names? Like, uh, give us some of the names. Yeah. So we, we went back and forth on the names because obviously we all feel very strongly. Um, but the first three are Stella, Sweetie, and Sabrina. So those are the three moms. Um, and then the little ones, for some reason, we named them before they were actually born, before we knew the sex of them. So... Uh, the first two to come out were Stella's babies. Those are Marvin and Douglas. Um, but Douglas is a girl. Marvin is a boy. Um, and then Sweetie is the second goat. She had a boy whose name was Maisie. <laughs> and then Sabrina is the third goat who had a baby named Spatula. That one was just last resort. My cousin had full full control there when naming her. <laughs> Spatula. So what's with the S's? I mean, Marvin and Douglas are, are, are you know, obviously exception there, but. Yeah, I thought we were going to name them all S names because I think that would have been cute, but confusing. Um, but I don't know. The first three just made made a lot of sense. But Maisie actually has kind of an interesting story. So she's Sweetie's baby. Um, but when Sweetie gave birth, she had twins. One of the twins didn't make it, sadly, but the other um, was having trouble feeding because Sweetie had a really bad udder infection. And it's really important that babies like get their milk right away. So my aunt basically had to like revive this baby goat and kept it inside, like bottle fed it, brought it to the vet. And eventually it turned into like we had to bottle feed it for about two months. <laughs> so we took it back to St. Louis and there was a goat living in the house, uh, it wore a diaper in the house. It slept on the couch with the cats. It was a full on confused goat it had no idea what animal it was so right now we're working on bringing it back into the other goats and trying to get it acclimated wow uh those you gotta have some pretty good photos from that i'd love to see oh yeah on christmas all over the presents eating the paper off the presents of course so lots of pictures well did the goats interact with you know uh some of these other animals. I mean, you mentioned the cat, but um, I didn't know if they befriended, you know, it sounds like being a pleasure farm, not a, you know, purposeful farm that there, there might be a lot of intermingling there going on between animals. Yeah, definitely. So we have two horses up there um, and they live in the same barn lot. So we built a little fence for the goats, but they live together. Um, and goats are actually supposed to have really calming effects on horses. That's something that we've learned. Um, haven't experienced that quite yet. The horses just kind of hate the goats and they're like, what are you doing in our house? Um, but 
yeah, other than that, when they were, when Maisie was in St. Louis being a city goat, she got along really well with all the cats and the dogs. So she was, she was really getting along well. But the big thing we worry about now is the coyotes because they're their main predator. So um, just have to keep an eye out for that, especially with all the babies. But they're tough. They've been hanging in there so far. Yeah, that's cool. Well, uh, I'm always curious about also idiosyncrasies like with animals in general. But, you know, you may or may not be aware, Grace, but every time my daughter cues up her saxophone, um, Hunter just incessantly starts howling. Like, I mean, it's, it's crazy. You can hear him for probably a mile away. That's how loud he is. Um, are there any unusual triggers or things about the goats that, that you guys get a chuckle out of? Not that we've seen vocally, but definitely the stiffening up is pretty frightening. Um, when you try, they like run around, they're pretty speedy little animals. So when you try and grab them to pick them up, sometimes they'll get like really stiff legged and it's a bit <laughs> surprising. It literally feels like you're like picking up a corpse. So um, that one is definitely getting used to that. And the other concerning kind of behavior is they really love to headbutt each other. So especially the pregnant moms, they were like headbutting each other's stomachs, which we were like, no, no, don't do that. Not good. So they're, they're definitely very physical with each other, but they also, they're getting to a phase now where they really snuggle, snuggle up together. They sleep really close to each other and like being warm. So a lot of physical things that are strange, but aside from the Ba, which I obviously vocalized so perfectly earlier, um, not a lot of strange vocal habits that we've seen. Well, are they affectionate with human with with you guys too, or just each other? Yeah, definitely. They are very, very you know accustomed to humans now. They love my cousin. He's been living up there, so they come up to him, they let him touch him, and you know they hang out. So definitely <laughs> love being around us and each other. So where do, does goats rank on your hierarchy? Like, if you had to make the choice between a dog and a goat, are you going goat? <laughs> I think I need some more kind of um, time with them because I was able to go home over the holidays. So I got to meet the first two babies, Marvin and Douglas, and they are so freaking cute. Like they are tiny and they, once you hold them, they're really comfortable and they love you. Um, But I think dogs definitely really love humans a lot more than goats. I think the goats like us, dogs love us. So Definitely something to consider. I mean, they're great. They're unusual. You would get a lot of questions on walks. So if you like that kind of attention, <laughs> good pet to have. Yeah. Well, I'm picturing I, David because we've been talking a lot about fur. Sorry. I was just going to say fair housing and like service animals. Like, you know, could we someday see a goat? And then we'd make sure to get that, that well, news over to Harina. Doug, <laughs> has some, Doug has some stories about that for service animals well, when it comes to fair housing. So mm-hmm. we'll have to ask him on the next, or maybe when we have him on here, like the craziest service animals that people tried to bring in. Um, man, I have so many. I didn't realize you're triggering all these memories about goats. Like my first time at a petting zoo, uh, I got knocked on my butt by a, by a goat. Like I, I was, I don't know, five, six years old and it just ran me over and, and (laughs) I couldn't get up because he was just standing on top of me and the class left me. So I got like detached from class. Um, but I did ask you or, or tee you up or, uh, ahead of time in our notes, I wanted to talk about the ROI. Like what are these goats? If, okay, I get a goat can clear, help clear an acre of land, but what's this goat cost me? So you got to feed it to keep it alive. So we feed it, you know, once a day, but feed isn't that much. They eat like alfalfa, corn, slash pretty much anything. Um, but aside from that, you can sell them for their meat. So the breed that we have is meat goats, which obviously we're not going <laughs> to do. Horrifying to think about, don't even want to mention. Um, but you can also get breeds that are more, suited for milking, but it's a pretty labor intensive process. Like you have to milk them twice a day in order for them to keep producing. So um, pretty intense. So aside from that kind of just very tangible gain, really it's just happiness. It's just good to have a goat around. They hang out. They're really funny. They're really entertaining. And then they clear some of the poison ivy. So you don't get, you know, super itchy. But aside from that, you know, it's just nice to have her out. I, well, I can't you, really say much else. Yeah, if you're if you're at seven now, how planned do we? How big do we let this herd get? I hope we stop it soon. 
because <laughs> all of the moms have had their babies. We're working on getting the little ones fixed. So I, I think seven is a pretty good number. Seven goats and two horses is a pretty full farm. So I think we're going to try and keep it around here. See what happens. Hopefully they all can fend their own against the coyotes and <laughs> we'll stay at seven. I think yeah. that's a good plan. If you do too much inbreeding, you'll end up with a Chernobyl uh, goat. <laughs> yeah, don't want that. Don't want that. <laughs> well, Grace, when's the next time you're back home? Hopefully soon. Um, I'd like to get back in the spring. So they'll probably be big by then. They're already getting huge, um, which is sad to think about. But I'll definitely be heading out to the farm, taking pictures, trying to pick them up if they're not too huge and giving them some love. Yeah. Well, uh, you'll remember, I think you were with us when we did our uh, goat to meeting. Um, we had the, the petting farm join our zoom call. Uh, we should do the same thing with your, with your family. You should take us around to the goats, uh, and, and the horses and stuff. I'd love that. They would love that too. I bet they love the attention. Yeah. What's a full grown goat way? I don't know. That's a really great question. They're not like too tall, but they're just very round, as you can imagine, especially when they're pregnant, they were like thick, thick girls. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure. I would guess maybe like 50 to 70. Reed's going to like more. scare your goats and then use them as like bench to bench or like do his <laughs> <Yeah>. lunges. <laughs> They'd be stiff legs and probably be good. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, if they, if they get that stiff, maybe not, or maybe that would work. So, uh, do they regulate their, um, you know, uh, I guess weight by themselves. I mean, if they eat just about anything, I just picturing a lot of like pretty rotund, you know, like, uh, you know, round, yeah, round girl. girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, we, we feed them the normal amount that one is supposed to feed a goat. Um, and I'm assuming that like a horse, you know, a horse grazes in the field all day, but we still feed them. So I assume that their body is made for it. Um, but definitely something to keep an eye on because we, we give them a lot of treats and we like to spoil them right now. So got to keep that in check. Do some laps, little goat treadmill. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, they're advertising heavily um, this, uh, what I'm sure is going to be a terrible series, but it's the Silence of the Lambs spinoff. Like, have you guys been seeing this with Clarice? No. I have not. Oh, okay. Is it Netflix? It's all about or... the lambs. So I, uh, no, I saw it when I was watching the Super Bowl, so I think it's actually on CBS. Ah. Um, but anyways, I, I just didn't know if you ever had any weird dreams or nightmares, you know, uh, with the goats bleeding. <laughs> Not <laughs> yet, but now I might. <laughs> I'm, I'm refraining from doing my uh, Hannibal Lecter uh, impersonation. Like, um, but anyways, I, I just had to ask since I saw all those commercials. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite yet. Well, Grace, do you have anything else to leave us with that we don't know about goats that we should? No, I would say I, I just, going back to where we started, I definitely do, did not know a lot about goats coming into this, but they're pretty fun creatures and it's fun to have little animals around that don't really serve a purpose. It definitely is a good reminder that, you know, a little bit of happiness is all you need sometimes. So I'll keep setting the pictures and I'll head back and have to see them and see how they grow. Um, but it's been super fun having them around. So I'm excited to get back and see them again. One last question and not to end on a crude note here. Um, but I'm going to, uh, right. so this is two part. One is, uh, bunnies, you know, which I've managed to hold off, uh, despite enormous amounts of pressure from my daughter, Ella. Um, yeah. One of the reasons we said we, we couldn't do it is because of all the little milk duds they, they leave, you know, it's like you, you turn around and there's, there's some more, <laughs> there's oh, yeah. some more bunny, bunny poop. So, What's uh, any commentary there on, on goats? Are they pretty prolific uh, on that side of things with all that they eat? Or is it more like, you know, I don't know, regulated uh, cycle? Yeah, no, they, they, they have it going. They eat a lot, so they produce a lot for sure. And we have to scoop that, which is not a fun job. And fortunately, I haven't had to experience that. But that's why little baby Maisie had to wear a diaper in the house because didn't want all that everywhere. So maybe if you get a bunny... Just buy a diaper. 
problem solved. That, that would have to be a sturdy diaper from what I, what I heard. <laughs> um, and then the second part of my crude questioning is around, uh, you know, the, uh, the making of, of more um, goats. So, yeah. you know, with dogs, you know, if the female's in heat, then, you know, there's all sorts of action going around. And then with bunnies, it's just like, you know, you blink and they've made it. So, yep. um, any commentary there? Like, is it uh, seasonal? Is it just like, you know, if the certain music's playing, you see them? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's happening for sure. They're getting, um, excited so we're we're working on that um but yeah goats can actually start producing young at like three months old so we had to like get on it right away um but yes they they are enjoying each other's company right now but um we are making sure that seven seven is our number <laughs> lucky seven okay well very yeah. good i appreciate you going there with me oh yeah absolutely yeah. Well, thanks uh, for sharing, Grace. This was a lot of fun. And now I feel like all of us and anybody that might be listening maybe uh, has goats on the Christmas list. I know I've had yeah. pygmy goats on the list for some time, but I've been told that's not going to work. So, you know, we'll see. <laughs> well, I support it. I support yeah. any goat. Well, we're uh, going to be moving from goats to trapeze. trapeze is here in a minute. So, you know, that'd be interesting to see if a goat could could do something on a trapeze with Greta. <laughs> you never know. We could give it a try. <laughs> All right, Grace. Well, thanks so much. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> We're here with Greta Walking. She's a paid media specialist on. What are you? Oh, you're on Adam's team. You're underneath Adam instead of. JD, now I got to start looking at that stuff. But Greta, <laughs> yeah. Reed has dubbed you. I don't know if you've ever told her this, Reed, but you've dubbed her the most interesting person at Digible. I have. You know, um, I was always a big fan of the Dos Equis commercials. Um, and uh, and so some, some, something there, I guess, uh, Greta. But the more I heard your stories and some of these, you know, I guess hobbies that you have, I, I felt <laughs> you deserve that title at Digible. So don't, yeah. uh, don't sell me short. Don't sell me There's short. A, of lot, this yeah. a lot of pressure, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and you have a number of hobbies. Uh, so uh, we've, Reed was mentioning like woodworking. Uh, of course, we're here to talk about trapeze, but uh, do you have any other hobbies that I'm not aware of that maybe we should have chosen for things you love? I think I would say probably anything circus related is the <laughs> what I like love the most. So flying trapeze uh, is a good one. <laughs> quick, quick detour. Reed, you may not know this, but when I worked at the dollar movie theater, 50 Cent Tuesdays, um, I thought it would be funny to make a calendar uh, to raise money similar to like the firemen. You know, they all go... <laughs> around shirtless so i enlisted all of the different people there to do uh to do whatever they do you know like what is your special skill and one of the guys we had was a fire breather um and so we were outside the front of the theater taking five fire breathing photos for our um for our calendar i'll just say corporate shut down the calendar shortly thereafter they were like you know, I know you've got six months of this thing done already, but we're going to hold uh, no more of this. And I was like, the fireman, though, I don't understand. So, yeah, that's yeah, my closest thing called to liability. Circus. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, love probably how when you say property. the dollar theater, you, I love how when you say dollar theater, you squeeze in the 50 cent Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> it's a steal, man. Dollar hot dollar is a 50 cent deal. Tuesdays. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Well, Greta, tell they have us the about... Elvis theaters here. Oh, what for a dollar for a discount? Sorry, I think there's like, yeah, it's like a buck fifty or something. Um, I thought that those had kind of ran their course uh, several years ago, but um, the Elvis theaters, at least here in Littleton, you can still go to the movies for a buck fifty. Nice. Yeah, there might be a slight lag, so we'll manage through this one. But uh, Greta, why don't you tell us about uh, your history with the circus arts? And in particular, we're going to get into the trapeze. Yeah, um, I guess I first started like loving the circus when I was two years old. So it's been a while. Um, I saw my first circus then and I've kind of just loved it ever since. Um, in middle school, I did unicycling and tried to learn how to juggle. I still can't juggle. I'm not coordinated enough for that. Uh, 
but yeah, I've kind of just been doing it on and off throughout the years. And in high school, I went to a baseball game and saw the Cincinnati Circus Company, I think it's called. They did like a performance. So I went and looked them up and saw that they had flying trapeze classes. And so obviously I wanted to do that. That sounded really fun. Um, I got kind of obsessed with the idea of going and um, I went with my brother actually to my first lesson and he was way better than me, which was really embarrassing, (laughs) but yeah, it was really fun. Um, The trapeze rig was outdoors and it was like summer. So it was just really beautiful and it was just the best adrenaline rush ever. So I kept doing it. Yeah, that's great. What kind of gear do you have to have? Like if this is your hobby, like, you know, I mean, like if you play flag football, yeah. you got some gear. What kind of gear do you need for this? Um, Nothing except for a flying trapeze rig, which is huge. And like three or four professional trapeze artists to help you. Um, So it's not really something you can do at home, obviously. But yeah, there's not anything else other than that. You wear a harness that they have. Um, and after a certain well, number, do they, uh, does everybody... oh, sorry. I'll just say sorry. after a certain number of flights <laughs> and I'll let Reed go, do they let you go without a pro similar to like, uh, skydiving? If you get X number of jumps, you're free. Probably. I personally don't even want to reach that point because I like having the people there <laughs> and like, there's so many, like, it's such a big area there's usually someone on the floor yelling at you someone on the platform you're on the platform and then the catcher so you know it it goes better when there's multiple people i don't really like want to ever do it alone or without a harness so well with the harness did you um i assume have a lot more confidence in what you would be willing to try So meaning, you know, swinging upside down or swinging with one leg, you know, how advanced or explorative did you get, uh, you know, in your time on the uh, trapeze? Yeah, the harness definitely makes it feel a lot better. It's still scary because you're moving pretty quickly and you have to kind of work with your momentum that you have. Um, but they like everywhere I've ever flown, they teach you when to do what, and they're also yelling at you when to do what. So, um, I guess just like some splits and flips is pretty much the extent to what I've done. Um, but yeah, it's really fun. And the harness is 10 out of 10. (laughs) Well, that's pretty cool. Flips and splits. Um, so did you jump also to other, Like trapeze, I always picture when I see the trapeze artists that they're throwing each other back and forth and, you know, whatnot. So did you do any of that or did you always stay on your own trapeze? Yeah. um, So the other person would be the catcher. And I have flown with the catcher a few times as well. Um, And like you do the trick and they catch you in their arms and it's great. Um, Something I'm working on next is to return back to the bar and be able to go again without falling into the net. But that hasn't um, worked out so far yet. But the catching stuff is really fun because you let go of the bar and you like land in the arms and it's just super fun. I love it. (laughs) Well, what else about the circus uh, do you enjoy? You know, there's circuses um, have been have become, I'll say, somewhat controversial, uh, usually, you know, oriented around the animals. So uh, what's your position on that? Yeah, good question. (laughs) Um, Obviously, anti-elephant usage, but most circuses have completely, like, gotten rid of that. Some maybe smaller family-owned circuses still have some animals in their shows, but I really prefer more of the Cirque du Soleil style, which is just people and, you know, artistry, costumes, really pretty music. And they're using these apparatuses and they're just doing really beautiful things with their bodies. I don't know. I think like the animal usage, obviously it's cruel, but it's also just kind of like gimmicky. I'd rather see what a human can do because then I can be like, I can do that, you know? Totally. 
how high up uh do you train like do you go is it uh, about 20 30 feet or have you been up much higher than that i think it's like 30 to 50 feet depending i know the ladder you climb up is 30 feet so that's probably right around there i hate climbing up the ladder it's like the scariest part for me because it's like a really tiny ladder that you climb up i mean yeah you're in your harness still but it's just very shaky and it's sketchy. So getting to the top of the platform is scarier, I think, than jumping off. But yeah, it's yeah. pretty high up, I'd say. Well, David, I don't want to bogart all the questions here. Well, my last thing was uh, your, you said your brother was better than you in the first go. So what is it? What's the most important skill or asset that you think a budding trapezist needs? Um, honestly, I think it's concentration because like when you go like your first two times, you'll be afraid to jump off a platform, which is a very rational fear. But <laughs> in terms of like a workout, like it's definitely, it like works your core and like some arm muscles or something probably. So that part's hard, but I think for me at least like staying focused Cause there's so many moving parts. There's multiple people, someone's yelling at you, you're jumping, swinging. There's just a lot of things going on and you have to really be good with your timing and knowing what part comes next. Like when do I move my left foot versus when do I move my arms? Um, and when you're upside down and there's a lot of distractions, it's easy to kind of get mixed up. So I think being able to really like focus is the key skill. And I guess my brother, had that and I didn't, but I work on it. Practice helps. Um, but yeah, definitely focus, I think is more important than like strength or flexibility is good too, but it's not like necessary for every trick. Yeah. I don't have the flexibility. So I think I'd be like a one trick pony. I'd be like a plank <laughs> that, that slings from thing to thing. <laughs> All right, read back to you. Well, um, I didn't know if you'd ever had, I guess, like drinks afterwards with the crew and, and heard some of the, uh, the war stories or horror stories, like, you know, where things went wrong or if, if they kept that from you, but I would imagine they that. They definitely have not told me their horror stories and I would rather not know. I mean, yeah, but it's not like there's always going to be risk involved with it, but, um, I don't, I have not heard any horror stories from people who I trust while I'm trusting yeah. them. Well, that, that's good of them. Cause I can't imagine if you're <laughs> doing trapeze work for long enough that there aren't some of those to share, but, um, and then what about the, the, you know, these professionals, like what, uh, is there any common denominators as far as like who they are or you know, their interests and stuff to, I assume most of them, even though they're professionals probably still have other jobs or am I wrong there? Like, is it literally 40 hour work weeks for them? Um, I would say, you know, flying in shows is like more of their like evenings and weekends, but they do tend to like do jobs you know, teaching at circus schools, but, um, a lot of them also, it's like a family discipline for them. So it's like been in their generations, just like the moms teach the kids kind of thing keeps going down the line. Um, and there's definitely like a little bit of an oddball factor, at least for everyone I've ever met, they enjoy scary things, <laughs> but totally at least like right now, I know Cirque du Soleil, declared bankruptcy and they're not doing any of their shows. So I'm guessing a lot of them are out of work right now and not really able to do performing jobs, but teaching, I guess, is still available in some places. That's sad. I didn't even realize that. I didn't know they had announced bankruptcy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually cried in the office. We were still in the office when they announced it. And I got so yeah. sad when I... Someone like texted me or something. I got sad. Well, they'll, 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 they'll come back. They're so popular. I, I can't imagine that they won't work themselves out of that. Um, but definitely a, a sad day for sure, especially for the trapeze enthusiasts, you know. 
So David yes, mentioned the like, best of the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I always feel sore like five minutes into just watching those shows. Um, so I can't imagine, you know, th- that being my life, but um, similar to snorkeling or scuba diving or skydiving, you took lessons, but is there also like, if you just want to experience what it's like with the harness to do some trapeze stuff, is there also, you know, I guess just where you sign up and do it um, versus like having to kind of get certified or have classes? Yeah, you can just sign up like at any of the schools. Um, We actually have in Westminster. um, So kind of close by there's Imperial Flyers. It's a trapeze club. So it's not a school. They don't do instruction, um, but they do like some open house events. Um, They're pretty fun. If you ever want to go, I think they're closed right now because of COVID, but they're like the oldest flying trapeze club in the U.S. So pretty legit. I'm picturing me and David wearing our, you know, digital garb, uh, (laughs) flying across. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Catching each other. Yes. (laughs) That would be classic. It's so fun. I definitely recommend it. I do think we need some more team building, right? So we did whitewater rafting, but when it gets back, I have on the agenda, like I wanted to do curling because there's a big curling center in Denver. There's a curling center. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I told Adam that I, or um, like we won that conference room competition. I want that to be our like team bonding event. (laughs) Excellent. It's so well, fun. <laughs> I know you're in. And then I uh, I think this sounds like a great team building too. So I just feel like we got to get to work, Reed. We're, I mean, we have to make up some time back when, when, uh, when everything's safe again. Yes. We will. Field trip to uh, Vegas. We can do it there. <laughs> now, now you're talking. Well, I, frankly, <laughs> with the, the ceiling height of our offices, we should just get a freaking trapeze bar built in, you know, like you look at that, uh, sweet a, you know, that's, I mean, <laughs> the rafters are pretty high up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, cool. Cool. Well, Greta, anything else we should know about your circus skills or trapezing? Like the only thing I can figure is that I would get up in that harness and I may have to use the restroom. And if someone's flinging me around, who knows what's <laughs> going to shake loose. So, uh, <clears throat> That's all I can figure, but is there anything else you should know? Yeah, (laughs) it is like, it. it's definitely, it can be scary for sure. But I mean, when you're up there, unless you lose control of your body, like you should know not to let go of the bar. And, you know, it's pretty beginner friendly when it comes to circus disciplines. You know, you could be like, I think four years old to up to 80 years old is the age range that the places I've been to have. So definitely beginner friendly. It sounds scary. You can get over it. Like you'll be fine. I recommend it. Well, David was kidding and maybe not, but about the leotard, uh, <laughs> is, is there specific gear? Like, you know, they joke, you know, that Texans always ski with jeans. Um, so I wouldn't want to like embarrass you if I, uh, if I came and showed up in the wrong gear. So uh, any requirements or suggestions on uh, clothing? Yeah. Um, so tighter fitting clothes are better. So like leggings and like form fitting tops. Um, and if you ever become a catcher, they tend to be wearing leggings or no top because you don't want to have the clothing interacting with your contact points. You don't want to have like any friction there. Um, so if you get to that level, you'd have to be willing to do that, I guess. But um, yeah, mostly just like leggings and they give you chalk for your hands too. So if you're nervous and sweaty, you still have grip ability. This sounds like uh, something that we need to turn Lurch on to. I, I think, uh, you know, he'd love to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> take off the shirt, <clears throat> show the guns and, uh, you know, wear his leggings, <laughs> put a little powder on his hands. It's a beautiful image. The poor guy has had two surgeries <laughs> in like three months. And you're like, next thing, <laughs> you know, high wire. Uh, All right. Part well, of his thank- rehabilitation, you know. Yeah, totally. Well, thanks, Grace. This is super fun. And um, uh, it does sound like you love it, as you said. And now I feel like I'm tempted to, to give this a show. I say 
I, it's nothing I would ever have put myself saying I wouldn't be into. I want to go skydiving and some other things too. But um, now that I know that there's one close by, that makes it even less of an excuse not yes, to do it. Definitely. Cool. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Okay. We're here with Steve Osborne, a, a shoot, an SEO strategist over here on the organic media team. Not like I should know what you do, Steve, because you're, it's not like I run that team or anything. Um, <laughs> but you joined us here in January. Uh, you came from your most recent venture, which was, I don't know, four, four or five years owning an escape room, which you still have. Um, but we, we uh, brought you out to the podcast because we wanted to hear really what it was like to talk about an escape room, but I don't really know how much you love it anymore now that you've owned one for so long. So give us your little bit of background on, on the escape room and what's happening with it today. Yeah, that's a totally fair question. Um, I'm super happy to be here in digital, uh, digital um, to start growing my career a little bit more in different ways, have a new challenge. Um, escape rooms have been an amazing thing for me in the past, but uh, they, they stopped challenging me at some point. And so I do still absolutely love escape rooms. Um, I'm just not super in love with them at the moment. And I just mean that on the business side, um, I have been beaten down as a lot of small business owners <laughs> do when they get when they get sold on the American dream. I've been beaten down by escape rooms, um, the industry, the industry part, but escape rooms themselves still love, uh, still think very highly of them. Is there truly an industry though? Meaning, would we not know, but are there like escape room conferences and vendors? Totally. So this is a very, very unique industry. Um, it is, it started out with people like me that just wanted to own a business, right? It was this brand new industry. Somebody kind of invented it out of nowhere, out of scratch. The first one started popping up in Japan. Um, the first one was in, C in the U.S. in Seattle um, in 2014, no, 2012, I'm sorry. I think the first one in the U.S. was in 2012, but it still took a few years to take off. And then when it did take off, it was a lot of people, a lot of hobbyists, a lot of single solopreneurs and everything. It, it created this opportunity for people to dive in and create a business from scratch, which is essentially what I did as well. And then so what it did is it built this huge, huge industry, uh, mostly guided by Facebook groups, um, uh, built a huge industry where everybody kind of communicates together. They all solve problems together. They give out everything they build. They all talk to each other. It's this really tight knit community. Of, of owners um, that own single single locations. Um, naturally, what happened with the progression is, is that the bigger guys started seeing um, the revenue that was coming out of escape rooms. And then so they started playing in two, which then created this rift in the industry. There's the two types. There's the small business owners. Um, and then there's the investors that come in and they just- Evil empire. Pie. Yeah. Exactly. Who, so, who the heck yeah. is the evil empire? Tell us about these people. You can so slam. Evil, yeah. The evil empires that came in are people that um, have a lot of money and usually have some sort of background in like theatrics, uh, set design, technology, stuff like that. These things that they entered into the industry um, that they thought the industry really wanted and needed, um, but it is essentially kind of destroying the industry from the ground up on what it was. And what I mean by that is they they came in looking for, you know, with financial motives, right? They, they just wanted to, to grab onto this craze with a bunch of really cool things that they do. But the core of escape rooms was that there was this personal experience by somebody that, by this experience that somebody built out of their brain. And there was a lot of physical components with it, like locking keys, the satisfaction of opening a lock in key or a pad or finding something was just so amazing. And then these big guys with money, they came in and they were like, okay, pff, that's cool and all, but we want to introduce a bunch of technology and magic things that happen in fog and smoke and doors popping open. And while that's super cool, um, it, it took away from what an escape room was. And a lot of that was like putting your phone down, stepping away from the modern technology world and just like entering and doing these fun things where you use your brain and you're not surrounded by technology and effects. You were just like a challenge against yourself. Um, and then so they ruined that too by creating an arms race where people thought they just needed a bigger, better product. Um, but really what has happened now is that people have invested a lot of money in escape rooms, but the demand, has, the demand has gone down a ton 
but the expectations have increased a bunch. So it's this really strange paradox in the world. And it's, it's, it's honestly, it's getting rid of a lot of escape rooms. A lot of them are closing down now. And that's outside of the pandemic that started happening um, about a year and a half ago, where a lot were just getting pushed out of the industry. Wow, uh, Reed, I, I, you, I, you said before that this started that we were going to have to do like a full episode, and now I can see how this is unraveling. Where we're going to have to do like an hour long conversation on this. So I'm going to hold my questions, but uh, I'll pass it to you uh, to kick off. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I don't know why we didn't. I mean, it's not that we didn't, because I remember when I first met Steve, I was already, I think, saying we need to do have him on the show and do something like this uh, or talk about escape rooms. I'm curious if any emerging or new trends surfaced, uh, not necessarily because of the big business investors coming in, but, um, you know, it, it may seem silly, but, you know, is it going, have, has anybody tried to move past just escape rooms? Um, you know, whether it's, you know, doing stuff like on boats or whether it's, uh, you know, um, not just an escape room, but like escaping an island, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, it, again, it may sound silly, Steve. I'm just curious, like how much as as you talk about the purity and the essence of like how it all started, if uh, there's some new ideas that have been born that you anticipate maybe coming, coming to market after COVID. Yeah. Um, so there, there has been a lot of this stuff. Um, there, there's one company now that does kind of like a, um, they have like a golf cart and you, you rent out the golf cart and I think it's in Phoenix and you drive around to different like little areas that they've set up to like solve it and just do things. So they're bringing that outdoors. Um, there is mobile, people have mobile ones that like they built escape rooms in the back of like a semi and they'll pull up to like a company office and everyone will come down and do an escape room. So there is, there is the innovation that happens and there's like different spin. It's definitely got out of the, getting locked in a room only is the only definition of an escape room. It's widened a little bit. Um, but one of these, another one of these big problems in the industry is that these things are really, really hard to do on scale because one of the ideas of the industry is that um, it was like this personal individual experience, right? You go in there, there's, you know, the people that you choose to be in there with friends and stuff, but no other else. This is your own personal experience for an hour. And so those limitations, um, don't allow for a lot of this innovation to happen because you don't see the return on them um, as a business. So um, it's there is innovation that happens. Um, I, it's just like individual owners that do it, and they they make their pockets a little bit bigger, but they have to work harder. And there's it's this scaling problem that people really have with innovation. Um, yeah, so. that makes total sense. Quick follow up on that still uh, i guess relates to the scaling is um because i haven't actually done one i've really wanted to we've talked about it a couple times uh when i was at the post um you know that was on the on the menu of team building and then even at digital but i still haven't gotten to do one so uh i can see that that's going to change now that you're here <laughs> once we're past uh we're in a position to do it but um you know who who does develop like uh so it, do you actually, before somebody goes in, or before a group goes in, can they, they ask or share preferences? Is there some sort of intake in other words, or is it like we have three themes this, this month or this quarter and you just, you know, you choose one of those. Yeah. So basically we, we build the themes and we just kind of give them a little like expectations before you walk in, like, okay, this is what to expect. Don't touch. Every room has like a little, like, don't mess with this. Cause it doesn't mean anything type deal. Um, but yeah, we just kind of set it up for success but really then it's your own experience you walk into a place and you have no idea where to start you have no idea what to do you don't really know anything and that's the beauty of it you start looking around like okay this is here this kind of looks like it matches with something over there on the wall how do those things connect together and then it's just kind of like a snowball effect from there so i'm really excited for you to now yeah now that i know this that so you haven't done one you definitely <laughs> gotta come in i'm excited to be your first which but, uh, whatever <laughs> I get That's that a lot. Of weird, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get the first for the trapeze read. <laughs> as well. yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I will have to be there when you do it, Reed, and I'll be watching in the back and just criticizing the whole time, just so you know. Yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> man. You do a color commentator. No doubt. Well, what, what do you think is more fun for you than Steve at this point? Like m designing a room for somebody or, um, 
or doing basically completing a room that someone else pulled together? Um, yeah, the whole, uh, I mean, the biggest love with it is, is, is making these scenes come to life, just having an idea in your head and building it all the way out and see it come from, you know, initial design of what the room should be, the theme, and then all these puzzle designs, integrating every puzzle into the theme, making it fun for the players, making, making that experience feel really, really fun and exciting for somebody. And then seeing that all come to life and then opening and launching the room is the most fun. And that's kind of where the joy and love for me has stopped. Because then once that is there, then this is the exact same experience, like on our, on the business side, it's the exact same experience every single time over and over and over and over again for these people that come in while they have an amazing, fun first time experience because you can only do a room one time. From the business side, it kind of makes you want to bang your head on the wall a little bit <laughs> yeah so that's where the love hate relationship comes yeah but, i could imagine you know. it's like we i'm sure reed gets this but it's like there's certain things that we come out with at digital and it's like the first couple people you show you're excited right and then it's like by the 10th person you're like ah, <laughs> i'm not really impressed with this anymore of myself myself you know so i could understand that so um how long do these themes live like how do you know when the sunset a room particularly if you have like your favorite that you pulled together, it must be sad to almost let it go, but you have to, from a business perspective, uh, I would imagine. And is there anything like, if this was a video game, like to make it replayable, people do like programmatic level generation or something. And in a physical space, it can't be programmatic, but I'm wondering if there's things you've thought of there uh, to make a room where you don't have to like wipe it clean all over again. Yeah, so this is a naughty little secret that I'm gonna tell you here that I think I'm one of the only ones in this industry that have figured out. Um, not to be all cool and cocky here, but my naughty secret is that we have never changed any of our rooms. I've built new rooms and added them, but our first one I ever built was Return to the Throne. It is still in action and it is still the most popular room. Okay, so this is where that arms race came. So people that do escape rooms, still to this day, over 50% have never done an escape room when they come in. Okay, so that's still a brand new customer to this day. I mean, imagine a couple of years ago, it was, it was like over 75%, over 80% 80 have never done a room, okay? Um, most people that do rooms are never going to do another room. It doesn't matter how great of an experience they have. They've done it. They've done the experience. They enjoy it. So there's this, only this small percentage of people that really need you to refresh the rooms. But a weird thing happens in the industry is that every single person that comes in, they ask you, how often do you change your room? Why? I don't know. They've done one of our rooms. We have three other offerings. How often do you change these? And the answer is like, well, every like six months to a year, we just blah, blah, blah. But then there, there, was this, there was this arms race in the industry where people kept flipping their rooms, always the bigger and better things, more, more, more. We want bigger and better. We're going to spend 50000 on this room. We're going to spend 100000 on this room. And then the returns, they simply were not there. They're not there. And then so I was like, why would I spend money on these rooms when it's more profitable? I don't have room. I can't possibly open up more time slots on the weekends when they're filling up every weekend. So I'm just going to keep making the rooms better as they go. Like they've definitely increased in like production value and quality, but they're still the same things and people still re can't replay them. That has taken nothing away from business. Most people still come in. It's still their first time. Um, and the only people that ever care are these like really loud, obnoxious enthusiasts that are going to come on and do all your rooms and they're going to do every single room in the city, no matter what you're going to get their business, no matter what. And if you build a whole room for them, you're going to get groups of two coming in, not paying a lot of money for like 30 different groups. And then there's not going to be that return again. So basically I did it smartly. I think um, I stayed profitable the whole time, worked with my own money, had great long vacations with my families and I never had to build these rooms and people were, now, you know, unfortunately, really sad for a lot of them decimated by COVID with huge, huge debts to pay back that aren't coming from anywhere. And me, I'm just living the dream, joining Digiball here and letting it roll. <laughs> yeah. Well, Reid, you have, uh, I, I kind of want to save some of these for a longer thing with Steve, but do you have anything else you want to hit before we let him go? No, I feel the same way. I, I think 
yeah, I mean, I have a lot more questions, so I don't want to shortchange or retread too much. I think we just uh, try and get something on the books here in the next 30 days for a, a full-fledged escape room podcast. Cool. Steve, is there any <laughs> last thought or something, fact you want to leave us with? Maybe a, a quirk fact or something that, you know, before you get out? Um, yeah, I've got some, not necessarily a quirk fact, but, um, you know, I spent a lot of time here in this um, kind of dogging on escape rooms. But we're talking about the business side and, and the owning a small business side. The reality is escape rooms, if you haven't done them, are one of the most exhilarating, fun experiences you can do. You will literally never forget your first one. There are so many cool little tricks and fun things that happen and the satisfaction that comes through your body that I strongly, strongly still <laughs> recommend people to do them. But they are very, very fun. They are really fun. And I do love that experience. Just wanted to clarify that. Well, I'm just going to leave us here and say I'm already like committed to this, Dave, unless you can talk me out of it. But Digital Summit 2022, I don't know that this is going to happen this year, but 2022, we have Steve build out an escape room up at our offices. We have a bunch of conference rooms. So unless you don't think you can work with that, Steve, I think that'd be awesome when we have people coming into town as part of like the overall, like, I mean, it's, it's usually two to three days, Steve, just so you know that, you know, we didn't get to do it last year is obviously online, but um, I think that'd be wicked cool, you know, as part of the fun, um, you know, who knows whether they, I mean, I think, I think a few people would participate. Don't you, David? Oh, like, can you imagine? Totally. <laughs> Joy, yeah, Joya going through an escape room. Yeah, that'd totally. And you can have like a, a team contest basically that goes with it, right. you know? Right. Awesome. It'd be apartment well, themed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, I would uh, love to make it happen. Start thinking. Uh, start. Start. You got a year and a half. <laughs> Hopefully, that's enough lead time. But maybe we can get you to do some more robotics. I don't know if he. Uh, we didn't mention that read, but that's a teaser. He his most recent escape room uses like uh, solenoids and robotics and different things. So, seems like fun. That sounds super cool. Yeah. All right, Steve. Well, thanks so much, man. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. All Take right. Care. Okay, we're here with Katie Pierce, and she's an account manager here at Digible. She joined us a number of months ago, and uh, I feel like Katie, you may have been—I don't—I feel like it was closet because I found out from another source that you're a, a huge Harry Potter fan, but in particular, the art, the artists of the Harry Potter films, I think, is what what you're the biggest fan of. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, you know, I'd love to say that as a late 30 something that I still, you know, imagine myself to be hanging out with preteens, but I don't make a lot of friends that way. <laughs> so I really had to find like a new angle to um, to to communicate it to other people um, because it is a lot bigger than that for me. Yeah. Well, if you looked at my Goodreads profile, you would see like young adult after young adult book. Uh, it's like, all I do is I go to the top young adult section and I'm like, I'm going to read that one now. So, uh, we should I, talk. I, yeah. Yeah. Exchange, totally. exchange lists. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell us about this. Like, how did you get into, uh, Harry Potter? So I, that's where it starts. And then tell us, sure. you know, you're gonna have to talk to us about the artistry here that, cause I didn't even know it existed, but it makes sense. Um, so give us the history. Totally. Yeah, um, so I was really late to the game. I was not a kid or a child when Harry Potter came out, the first book. Um, I think I started reading the books in 2005, and please don't do the math, but I was 22 at the time. And I was actually studying abroad in Scotland, and I had a bunch of British flatmates who were just horrified that I had never heard of Harry Potter. Uh, but I was a college kid, you know, I mean, it kind of came in right as I was leaving high school. and. Um, so they gave me the first book. And then a few months later, the, I believe the Goblet of Fire came out. And so we did get, um, stand in line to get tickets to the midnight showing so that I could tell the rest of the world. I truly was like one of the first people to see it. I was totally hooked by them. Yeah. So it definitely evolved over the years since then, but that was the start. So books or, or movie preference? Ooh, Gosh, um, you know, I love the books, um, but like as an adult reading a child's book, there certainly is something to be desired with uh, writing style and vocabulary and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, I think that one of the things that's so great about Harry Potter is that it is like this magical world that 
is inserted into a world that we are all very knowledgeable of and familiar with. So I love the idea that there's something secret left to this world, that we haven't figured everything out, um, and that there are things that defy even the, the most intense logic. And that's definitely the draw for me into that, the fantasy genre um, in, in the whole overall. Yeah, it's like Star Wars. All they did was a galaxy far, far away. That's as much integrated <laughs> yeah. as it got. <laughs> Nothing beyond that. Yeah. Uh, but oh, yeah. Reed, I think we started have, on Star Wars. Have your girls gotten into Harry Potter? I know they are in the per- Percy Jackson, but is Potter time yet? Yeah, they they've exhausted the whole Percy Jackson. Um, you know, in fact, Ella I think has now read it twice, and those are like twenty books all in. Oh, wow. um, she just isn't hasn't fully taken and it it surprised me because you know I, I got her a couple different versions of the harry potter books you know some with a little bit more ornate or illustrations and then you know the big ones. paperback or something but uh yeah yeah right they're huge i know exactly uh, which one you're talking she, about <laughs> she's, oh yeah i bet you do um and so this leads me back to you mentioned the fantasy genre like ella is is the one that david's more referring to although avery's also read a lot of the the percy jackson um but she seems pretty drawn by the lord of the Rings stuff um and the spirit animals i could go on and on um how how do you distinguish between all these different fantasy um and i don't mean the basics i just is what makes harry potter so unique within the fantasy genre because i don't feel like it's the only one that that you know, taps into that by any stretch. I mean, that's ridiculous. So what, what is the magic um, that, that isn't necessarily something others have, have captured as effectively? Oh, you know, I think the, the character, the, or, you know, just the, the basic three, you know, Hermione and Harry and Ron is kind of checks off all of the boxes. You know, I think that that's really what pulls people into fantasy is that we see a little bit of ourselves in that, in that character, we identify with it. We're challenged with the classic good versus evil battle. Um, good always triumphs evil, even though it doesn't really seem to be. Um, but I think that those three characters really check all of the boxes of the things within ourselves we are maybe a little embarrassed about or that we we love about ourselves. So, you know, like heroism, intelligence, goofiness, you know, even that sometimes downright dense. Um, so I think that that's the initial like hook. It's not just about the world. It's also, you know, drilled down on a very personal level. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Well put. Um, so then uh, I w- would ask this or somebody might ask me like about the Star Wars, like because, you know, you're joking about your age. I, I could I could <laughs> we could have 20 minutes about uh, age <laughs> jokes for me. But um but everyone was like, well, what was your favorite Star Wars? And I said, Empire Strikes Back. And it's like, why? And I was like, well, it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit darker, more, you know, you you find out this, you find out that. So for you, with all the Harry Potter, um, what's your favorite and why? Uh, favorite book? Um, ooh. Great question. Um, it's kind of hard for me to say that, but I, I, I love Order of the Phoenix um, because to me, that's like really the merging of the two worlds. That's when they kind of leave and discover that all of the things that they've been experiencing are actually existing in the greater wizarding world outside of Hogwarts. Um, so for me, that's, that's really it. And plus I'm just fascinated by Sirius Black's townhouse and all of the dark magic that seems to uh, add to its illusion. Super, super interesting. I, I'm, yeah. you know, not in a good position here because I haven't read all the books and I fully okay. expected to go on this ride with my daughters. Um, and I think I still may, you know, um, to, you know, obviously you experienced it in your twenties, um, yeah. or started there. So I don't think, you know, it, it may feel funny sometimes reading a children's book, you know, there's, there's no, uh, age limits or boundaries to Harry Potter. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get a chance to go through this and then I'll be picking your brain or, you know, finding new, new avenues of conversation with Katie <laughs> over the years. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it anytime. I mean, um, you know, one of the questions you guys asked me a few minutes ago was, you know, what, what's the appeal now? You know, what haven't I thought about a thousand times since I started reading those books all those years ago? Um, and for me, you know, I was an art kid, an art student, um, got an art degree. Don't, 
don't ask me too many questions about that. <laughs> it's a little bit shameful. Uh, but, um, you know, I really appreciate the level of like concept development that went into bringing those books to the big screen. You know, I mean, everybody's kind of mad at or upset or disappointed with JK Rowling right now. Um, and, you know, we, I certainly don't want to get into that, but, um, you know, she wrote those books and she developed the initial concepts, but the people who really made a visual representation of that, um, the level of attention to detail, um, the uniqueness of that, uh, that is really what draws me. Um, and you see a lot of that in Fantastic Beasts and other places like that too. Um, but primarily it's, it all boils down to these two concept artists who were brought on board early on um, and they developed everything. So even, you know, the way the chocolate frogs, the packaging of a chocolate frog, it's the same duo. Their names are uh, Mira Foramina and Eduardo Lima. So they have developed a design house called uh, the House of Mina Lima. And if you want to check it out, their website is the exact same thing, minalima.com. Very easy. Um, but so they just, they developed everything, even uh, Professor McGonagall's handwriting. So when that first letter arrives for Harry, it's an iconic moment. It's, it's her handwriting on there. But not only that, but it opens up and it opens up in a unique way. It's not just like a, you know, a gift um, gift card or anything. Um, so they even developed, you know, the motion and the mechanics of that fold, which, you know, just blows my mind. I'm not somebody who's very good at puzzles, but, um, you know, in last year they came out with a very illustrated book, which I wish I could show everybody. Um, but inside of it, so they're gilded and I'm going to show you guys while I'm talking about it right now, but inside this book is it's very thick and there are pop-ups. So they have since, I guess, some licensure maybe ex expired and they've, they were able to get more access. They've added like pop-up elements to it. So I really want to show you this. Um, it's fascinating and incredibly talented people. And they've really kind of blown up that, that style and design concept even after the movies. So while I pull this together here. Yeah, I it's very, you, it's very large. When you sent me the note about it, I was blown away that there were two people that had made their career off of it, but it makes sense. Um, yeah, it's like one of those pop love uh, car, greeting cards, if anybody's seen those before. But um, I could see like maybe read that's ex eventually what you need to get your daughters into <laughs> into Potter. But now um, Katie showed me the website and they have like a, a store in London um, that you can go visit and other things. And I was like, gee whiz, Katie, like they must have, I mean, they like got in and to that first film. And then even though the films changed directors and other people like along the way, they stuck with it to where now after the fact, they're still running a business with the two of them on it. And uh, yes, just way to grab hold. Yeah, that's so that's cool. amazing. That totally, yeah, that totally would grab my my girls. So you'll have to send me. I'm assuming you can get that off Amazon, Katie. You can, yes. So the edition that I just showed you is a limited edition. So also bear in mind that the, the British version is the Philosopher's Stone, not the Sorcerer's Stone. So I bought the British version. Um, it's This is a gilded version as well. So you can get a version of this on Amazon. It's not signed and autographed, which I bought two of, one to touch and one to put away. Uh, and um, so you can get them. Yeah, they are issuing one every year. So the one that I just, I have in my hands now, um, I purchased in October and the second one is out for pre-order. It'll be shipped out in October of this year. Um, but I fully plan to go to that store in May of 2022 when I visit the UK. I already have the trip planned and everything. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. So are well, you Katie, still- Is there anything- Go ahead, Reed. Sorry that we're back to that delay situation. So I'll let you <laughs> handle it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The lag is frustrating. Um, are you still in touch with, uh, you know, the folks that when you were had the, uh, those flats, like, uh, with the, uh, when you're in Scotland, like, uh, do yes. they now accept you because you're like a full on guru? <laughs> Um, yes, I do still keep in touch with them. And, and luckily, they are all very much involved in the art scene um, as professional artists to, um, to this day. Uh, so I look forward to connecting with them and getting some tips on 
places to go and things to see. I mean, you can make a whole week long trip of different Harry Potter destinations in the UK. So that's super cool. We're hoping to go to, to Europe. Um, I'll just say in the next few years, uh, <laughs> see how things go with this. Well, it's not, uh, so easy when you got a family of five, but, um, my girls Imagine. are totally enamored with, you know, castles and, you know, fantasy. And so they're very eager to get over there. So it'd be nice that you all have, have that trip under your belt and you can give us some pointers. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd love to, um, they could, I can show you where to take a Quidditch class. <laughs> I wonder if that's anything with like uh, uh, with the trapeze artist read. It's like you take your you can either do trapeze or you can do some Quidditch. Those are your two options. <laughs> I think they're going to choose Quidditch. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for this, Katie. Oh. This was terrific, and I feel like as Reed said, like uh, there's so much more to learn about. It's like any anybody that does something, they put their heart and soul into it. Like J.K., which I don't know anything about this drama, so I'm going to be googling here in a minute. Oh. Uh, but everyone puts their heart and soul into something like this and it, there's just so much depth. And I think that's really the interesting thing about these, some of these young adult, uh, books, right. It's like on the surface, it's easy for someone to pick up, but also you can get into it and there's a lot of depth. So super cool. And I appreciate oh, yeah. you sharing with us. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. We're now here with Noah Leach. Uh, I was just teasing Reed that this is the podcast he's been waiting for. Uh, but Noah is a, a paid media strategist, uh, of course, on our paid media team. And Noah, you are brought to us today to speak specifically about coffee because I think you're no ordinary coffee connoisseur or snob. But you started to tell us the fun fact about your last name because Leach is based off of the animal of the leech. And you said it went back to the Middle Ages. And I had wanted to get to you real quick, like... Is that because your family was in the medical profession, if you will, like in the Middle Ages, where you're like slinging leeches at people? I I, th I think that might be um, kind of somewhere back in the lineage. Yeah, I came from a family of doctors, which is kind of ironic because I can't stand any sort of medical thing now. Um, so it's kind of funny that that didn't transpire down to me. Um, and I, also, I, I don't as long as far as my immediate family, I, I don't know anyone who's a doctor. So that's also kind of funny that it. Trend has started <laughs> off as such by a strong medical background with the last name, and now there's no one remotely close to that field at all. So, yeah, well, good thing. Just don't for show and tell at the office. Don't bring in your box of leeches because you're well, going to run some people I'll out not if to. you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk to us about coffee. How did you get into coffee? How'd you get into roasting it? Like you've taken it further than most, it seems. So, uh, give us that background, and then. I'm more of a tea guy, so Reed is probably going to have a thousand follow-ups. Well, before yeah. you get started, what uh, what cup are you on? Um, I am on, I think, three or four today. Um, so yeah, I just brewed this cold brew. Um, it's like a flash cold brew kind of thing, so you can basically do a pour over, but like use half the amount of water for ice to kind of make a mock cold brew. And so I'm doing this new one from Corvus that's from the Congo, um, so it's pretty tasty. Very cool. And what's the cutoff like for you? Uh, is it five o'clock? Or you know, I I don't have a cutoff. Uh, when whenever I'm back home, uh, having coffee with my dad or whatever, like we'll have a cup of coffee with dessert right before bed, and I can like coffee doesn't affect me in that way. I can have a cup right before bed and sleep sleep like normal. So um, I really yeah, I don't really have a cutoff. Just kind of nice. That's amazing. I do, and I don't hope that I get to that level, Noah. Makes me think of the Princess Bride when uh, they're sitting across from each other and he drinks the poison. And he's like, for years and years, I built up a tolerance. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it doesn't affect me. Anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry. I intercepted there when I let you give us your roots on the whole coffee enthusiast. Yeah. Um, so actually, my this, you might find this funny, Dave. It's my initial history is actually with tea. So every Wednesday in elementary school, up through high school, I'd go to tea with my grandma on Wednesdays and we would try like, four or five different teas a day. Um, so that's kind of how I got into the, I guess, warm beverage industry per se. Um, and yeah, so my coffee liking didn't really happen until my summer um, after my freshman year of college, I came back home uh, to Illinois where I'm from and I had a summer class I had to take. And so I went to the local coffee shop and I just ordered like a black cup of coffee and I poured like a little bit of sugar in because growing up, both my parents like drink it, <clears throat> drink it black every day. Um, and so I knew I couldn't put creamer in it, otherwise they'd disown me. So I decided to do a little bit of sugar, 
And through the course of the week, I kind of weaned off the sugar till, until the end where I just drink it straight black. Um, yeah, and ever since then, I've I've appreciated coffee. And um, yeah, that, that sophomore year of college, my roommates and I, we would go to a new coffee shop here in Denver every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. And so we would kind of get a list and all three of or three or four of us would go and drive to the coffee shop and kind of just sit, you know, order different drinks, like sometimes two or three drinks at the coffee shop, hang out for a couple hours. And we'd always get like the coffee, the signature like diner mug that the coffee shop would sell. So like towards the end of that year, we had like all the diner mugs kind of lined up um, in our, in our dorm room. Um, so it was kind of a fun thing that we, we started to do. Um, and then within that, we got into the pour overs. So we'd have like competitions with each other, like to see who could make the best Chemex um, or who could pull the best shot of espresso from like a $20, you know, Mr. Coffee espresso we picked up from a thrift store. So um, yeah, we had a lot of fun that year and it was, yeah, it's kind of really where my coffee passion like really dove into. Wow. And the roasting. Cause I think that's what stuck out to me is like, you're not just like, like Reed, he enjoys coffee. He's, he talks about that constantly. Uh, well, shouldn't, I'm not trying to make that negative read. You just are very, you're not shy that you, that you like a good cup of coffee, but you didn't get into roasting Reed versus Noah. I've heard that you do some roasting. Yeah. Noah um, doesn't have uh, uh, three kids and you know, a wife and maybe you have a wife, but I, uh, <laughs> All I'm saying, David, is that if I if I didn't have all the overhead, if you will, I think I'd be in roasting by now. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So I, what kind of struck roasting is I worked at a coffee shop here in Denver called Purple Door, um, my junior year of college, and I kind of was a coffee marketing and media intern. So I kind of would help at the roasting facility. It's actually just over here in Inglewood, um, pretty close to the digital office too. And so I would work with his name's Mark, the founder and owner of the company. And so I kind of learned how he like was into roasting. Um, and it just is like a whole nother level of coffee that um, I don't know, you, you're able to connect partners with the green coffee growers and like, you know, extract like these delicious flavors and notes that you get from coffee out of roasting. Um, and so I, I didn't really get much to it into that until this past year in 2020, I met with um, one of my friends who has his own design studio. Um, and he kind of got behind my coffee idea. And so he built out like a full brand for my shop um, and for the branding that I wanted to do. And then he kind of invested in me like a little home roaster that I have here set up in my garage. And so I've kind of, and I just got 50 pounds uh, last week from Guatemala of green coffee that I'm trying to dial in to get the best like roast profile so I can start hopefully selling it to some friends and family and, you know, maybe coworkers or a farmer's market or whatever. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And, um, I'll get this out of the way and then I'll let Reed dive deep because uh, my knowledge is shallow here. But what is the best uh, cheap coffee? Like, I'll, and I say this because um, to you, like to your palate, because there's people that love cheese, right? And when you love cheese, it's like the stinkier, the better it seems. But then you have the people that are with the Velveeta. So I imagine it goes that way with coffee where the, the more you get into it, the deeper you go down the stinky cheese category. But when our, um, when Victor, our director of engineering joined us, his first time visiting in town, he went to 7-Eleven to buy a giant can of Folgers coffee. And he's like, oh, I just love Folgers. I don't need any of that stuff Reed bought at the office. And I was like, all right. Um, now I think Victor's changed his mind. He's off the Folgers sauce. But uh, is there a almost guilty pleasure of a cheap coffee that you could do? Um, and then I'll let Reed you know, dive, dive more in. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite, if like I, I'm on a road trip or, you know, half – to get a cup of coffee, it's probably Dunkin' Donuts. I think they've got the best kind of cup of coffee that isn't like burnt like Starbucks. And so it has like, you know, some flavor on like Folgers or Maxwell House. Um, so yeah, if I like need a cup of coffee or, you know, on a road trip, Dunkin' Donuts is probably my like cheap go-to. Well, you mentioned green. Um, what? Is, how are you distinguishing between that and organic? And I'm not trying to, I just want to, for, I guess, listeners that are wondering what green coffee is, can you help define that and distinguish it between that and organic? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess I meant to say kind of like just raw coffee beans. Um, so mainly just, it's like the, the post- it's like the the fruit of the plant. Um, once it's grown, it just turns into like basically like your your regular coffee bean, but it's it's green, so it just basically means it hasn't been roasted yet. Um, in organic, 
I don't know that I can get into this a little bit later with some of the other questions, but kind of like the organic and fair trade, there's a lot of like division within the coffee community about like how that's brought about. And so like, I, to be honest, I don't quite know like what makes something organic versus um, just standard. I know like people kind of slap that label on, especially in the coffee world, like it's willy nilly. Um, so, but yeah, basically the green coffee is just like the unroasted bean of, um, of the coffee plant. Yeah. Um, so David asked you about your guilty pleasure, you know, and I'm with you on the Dunkin' Donuts. That's, I would have said the same thing. I, that's my biggest issue with Starbucks and a few others, you know, is just that that they do burn the coffee. I just don't get it. But um, you mentioned Guatemalan beans that you got your hands on. So have you been to Central America? And, um, you know, I didn't know if, uh, but, you know, some of these different countries, like whether it's Guatemala, um, or whether it's Nicaragua or whether it's, you know, Colombia or whether it's, you know, um, Costa Rica, which, you know, I was there for David's wedding just a year and a half ago and I was in heaven. Um, I wasn't sure what I, what to expect, but, uh, they did come through like the coffee was fantastic, super strong. Um, so what are your thoughts on, uh, yeah, some of the different, it's like talking about Napa, you know, like California wines versus like what you get in Europe. So, uh, any any i guess opinions there i'm sure <laughs> yeah um so i actually i haven't been to central america i someone on my, my wife's family um one of her cousins just married a guy and he had a connection to some co- like a farm down in guatemala that he hooked me up with and they sent me some coffee to try um but i think my all-time favorite has got to be ethiopia you know essentially the, the birthplace of coffee i think a lot of their coffees tend to have more of that fruity bright acidic taste which is something i prefer um because essentially you can break coffee into two different tastes like base level taste you have one that's more fruity and then one's more like chocolatey kind of nutty like your your classic cup of coffee um and so i i I tend to do the more fruity side just because i think there's more of a complex flavor like profile to it and taste and i i just kind of enjoy them that more fruity thing in general so typically like the ethiopia or the costa rica or like the guatemala will kind of have that more fruity side um but yeah some of the i have some, have some from rwanda that's uh, pretty chocolatey nutty that like tastes like you're just drinking like you know like a chocolate bar which is like super delicious um but yeah i gotta go ethiopia costa rica and colombia are probably or and guatemala are like my top top countries to get single origin from yeah totally um i assume you're familiar with spur spur coffee here yeah I think that was a My, yes. Uh, no, I don't yeah, yeah, I actually. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I um, they used to have a shop right here down in downtown Littleton. I would go do a lot um with my great grandma because she lives kind of near it. Um, but then they closed. And I know they have their location down in Denver, which I I still like to go to. Yeah, they just they introduced me to the fruitier stuff. I I hadn't um I guess come across that. You don't see it as much. I mean, now it's it's showing up more in the stores like you even go to Whole Foods and you'll find some of those types of flavors, but they that that's their whole deal. And they were buying their beans from somebody else, but now they're roasting their own and they've really gone far down that path and I totally agree as far as the sophistication of the the flavor profiles. It's just amazing. So I highly recommend that. Um, when it comes to dark roast versus light roast, you want to, uh, I guess, offer a little commentary there, um, you know, how you feel about it. Um, I'm I'm not trying to lead here. I'm just letting you be the expert. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I typically will only buy light roast. I think, um, I think there are some instances where like a medium or dark roast can be done well, but as a whole, like, like Starbucks, they, um, they tend to just burn their, even their light roast is a dark roast on most specialty coffee, you know, standards. Um, and I get, and kind of what, what they do is, so when, as in roasting, you usually stop the roasting machine when you hit first crack, which is where the beans, the moisture actually starts cracking out of the bean itself. And you can kind of hear that. Um, and so with, to get like a darker roast, you'll typically go a few minutes past the first crack. Um, and then places like Starbucks, you'll actually hit like a second crack. And then because it's, so burnt and it's it's cracked twice has no moisture it just the oils hence why you get those oily beans um and so yeah i i just think light roast you're able to get a lot more flavor out of it you're able to kind of you know extract those complex flavors like we were talking about and just with the medium or dark roast you kind of 
lose that, you know, complex flavor. And it just becomes like, um, you know, just like bean juice, essentially, <laughs> like it's, you know, there's really no taste or flavor to it. Yeah. It's just kind of, you know, just like, yeah, bean, bean juice. So <laughs> totally. So David mentioned the cheese. Um, I mentioned the wine, so easy, like, right, the pairing between the two. What about uh, for you when it comes to coffee? Um, what are some of the better pairings as far as, um, you know, what, you, what you're what you eating with it, like in the morning versus what you're doing in the afternoon? Uh, lots of people have the dessert, you know, kind of coffee, right, um, with the espresso and whatnot. But, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about what pairs well with, with the different times of the day and different coffee that you drink. Yeah. Um, so in the – in the morning, I'll probably just have, you know, my basic breakfast, like eggs and toast or that kind of thing. Um, I've, I actually avoid bananas in the morning because the way the banana and the potassium, it, it um, messes up your palate while drinking coffee. I know it sounds like super nerdy, um, but I've, I've done a lot of research and yeah, the, the way the banana is, it, it, it taints your palate. So you're not able to taste coffee. So I used to drink, or I used to have a banana every morning with my coffee, but like since reading that and learning how it kind of messed up my palate, I don't do that anymore. Um, and then afternoon, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of like an afternoon cold brew typically. Um, you know, it's just something good about like an ice drink kind of in the afternoon is inviting and refreshing. Um, and then, yeah, always you know, like a shot of espresso or like just a cup of coffee with dessert. Like, you know, that, that can't, that's like hand in hand. Like when I spent time in Italy, um, yeah, every night, you know, you'd end with like your limoncello and then you'd have like your tiramisu or your, you know, it's croissant or whatever. And then you just would have your shot of espresso and kind of just a good like night end of the night. Yeah. Well, one more question then I'll turn it back to David. Um, when it comes to French press versus pour over, I mean, just the different, I guess, ways of producing coffee. Um, you're now clearly a, a master of the pour over, but tell us a little bit about that journey and your thoughts, uh, I'll say between French press, because that's what I just left, um, you know, for the pour over. Uh, and I struggle because I'm not the connoisseur quite that you are uh, in, in helping distinguish what, what the real difference is. So yeah. Uh, enlighten us. Yeah. So really the, the main difference between like a French press and a pour over is just kind of the, the type of the filter. Um, so the French press, you know, since it's more like the mesh, you're going to like end up with a, a pretty grainy, pretty kind of gritty cup of coffee. Um, so I actually, I do French press a lot when I'm camping just cause it's, it's super easy, super easy to clean up and, you know, a little bit more portable than bringing like a kettle and all that. I just need a, something to boil hot water. Um, but the, with the pour over, like my favorite is the Chemex. Um, and I like the Chemex cause it's a pretty thick, um, filter. And so you get that really smooth, um, really filtered cup of coffee. So you're not going to have like any grain or any grit within it. And so that's typically where you find the difference between like a pour overs versus like a, a French press or, um, yeah, it's kind of just the, gr the grit taste where like the pour over is going to be very smooth. Um, and then, uh, if, if you want to get really fancy, there's a, you can look into a siphon, um, which is you boil a thing of water under a Bunsen burner. It siphons the water back up to the kind of this canister, you pour the grounds in it. And then once you take off the heat and then once it, um, the bottom, you know, bowl cools down, it, it sucks and, or siphons the, the coffee back through a filter. And so that's a good way to kind of get that French press taste just without the grit since the, the filter will be pretty thick. So um, I actually have one of those and it's it's pretty fun to explore. So if you're looking for something kind of kind of on the next the next level, I, the siphon is uh, the way to go. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Gonna have to try that, but I'll want you next to me <laughs> so I don't blow anything up. Be beaker from the Muppets, you know? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I my only question, and I know we're up against time, Noah, but all right, Noah, the only question I have left is the ROI. So I just can't imagine that you save a lot of cash by shipping in your own beans from Guatemala and roasting them. Would we be surprised? that there, I mean, on one hand, I've heard that coffee has a hell of a markup. So I guess on one hand, I should think there is an ROI, but whenever you do this small batch stuff, sometimes it's like, there is no ROI. So do you get anything out of doing this or is it just a hobby? Yeah. Um, so actually it's, it's cheaper to, to roast your own beans. Um, cause like you're talking about the markup on green or on bags of coffee. Um, like most shops will have, you know, coffee bags range from anywhere from 15 to sometimes 22 or 
even the, some of the more smaller tins of coffee, like 150 grams are like 35, 40 bucks, um, you know, for 150 grams of, of beans. And so where the, and the markup is, if you break it down, like per bag, um, it turns out to like anywhere from three to $5 for that, for that green, green beans. Um, and so, yeah, so like this, I got 50 pounds from Guatemala, um, and they actually have a distributor out of, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And so I just had to pay, I think 25 bucks shipping for the 50 pounds. And then it was like three, no, I think it was like, yeah, two bucks per pound. And so all in, I was like at 125 um, for 50 pounds of unroasted coffee. And so, I, you know, I roast it. Um, and actually, when you roast, you lose about four ounces. And so that's why most bags of coffee are 12 ounces over 16, because for every 16 ounces of green coffee, it only produces 12 ounces. Um, and so I could sell, I could hypothetically sell that 12 ounce bag of coffee for, um, let's say like 16 bucks. And so I, I'm all in like $2 and maybe a dollar and a half for like the bag and the materials or whatever. And so I'm still, you know, making like $11 per bag. Um, so yeah, so it's actually pretty cost effective to kind of roast your own beans. Um, especially like on a smaller scale, if you just want to do that. So yeah, it's a, I'd say it's yeah, a pretty not good investment. Bad if you're really into it. I mean, I feel like I could do that with tea. Like if you buy some of this tea is like $20 for a couple ounces, it's unbelievable. And I'm like the markup on spices in tea is like, seems insane, but also the roasting is not something I'd have to do with tea. I'd just be buying a big 50 pound sack of tea. So <laughs> not quite the same, uh, uh, there, I guess. What surprises me about that markup on both sides, the tea and the coffee, is usually when you you're in a highly competitive industry, you see margins compress. You know, it's it's inevitable. It's like, well, if I'm making eleven bucks on every bag, you know, I certainly can do it. You know, be fine with the eight bucks, and then you know, drop just drop the price, and eventually it starts sucking everybody down into that vortex. Um, but that doesn't happen. You do see different grades of coffee, but people are very willing to pay 15 to 20 bucks a bag, you know, if they feel like it's, you know, kind of that upper echelon, myself included, um, you know, and I can tell the difference now. I, I couldn't before, but it's like a bottle of wine, like, you know, 10 to 15 bucks versus a bottle of wine that's 20 and above. Like, can you really tell the difference with coffee for whatever reason? It's pretty easy for me. So I, I usually stay in that range you're talking about, but it, it still surprises me that, you're not seeing some of the those premier like um, just in order to pick up more market share, bring down their price just a couple bucks. Yeah, and I, I think that has to do with a lot of the the push toward direct trade in coffee because um, I know fair trade used to be a big thing, but there's so many issues with how the U.S. was handling the fair trade that a lot of shops are doing direct trade where they partner directly with farmers, and so instead of paying like how I did like the one to two dollars for per pound of um, green coffee, they'll kind of up it to like anywhere from three to five to, you know, pay themselves, like invest in that farm and build a long-term relationship. And so then they can, they still keep like the, enough margins, you know, to stay profitable, but they're paying them higher. Um, and then to uh, some of the beans, they like Corvus or specifically releases that are like 35 to 40 bucks for like a little tin. It's, it's mainly like the scarcity of those beans. Um, like a lot of them are like the geisha beans. And so they're like in very remote, very hard areas to grow the coffee. Um, that that's actually something too. Like the more the coffee bean struggles to grow, the more flavor and like complexity that comes out of it. And so that, I think that kind of goes in the hand of hand with, you know, how expensive coffee can be and like how much you can mark it up. Like you could, you know, buy a little tin for 40 bucks and people will buy it. So yeah, crazy. Well, um, thank you, Noah, for coming on. This is really enlightening. And I feel like, uh, I heard you chuckling on like the geeky or the nerdy side of things. Uh, but I think it's really fun. As Reed was saying, we just love the passion and when people are super into things. So um, I know you do a master class for the company tomorrow on, on coffee. So we'll be excited to see that, but thank you for all the time. Yeah. Thanks guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I'm I'll, I'm going to say I'm happy that Noah's here because he's going to elevate our coffee game at Digible. Um, I felt like I was flying that flag by myself. Um, I tried to get Adam on the train and he like reverted back to Folgers and I almost slapped him. I was like, how dare you? <laughs> but, um, you know, we have the Keurig and, 
you know, the Nespresso, but I'm just like, come on people. So, uh, I'm counting on, you Noah. now I got a, the worst uh, part is going to be uh, is if you don't actually like Noah's beans, for digital. you know, <laughs> you have to have that awkward <laughs> <Right>. conversation. <laughs> yeah, I don't think this is that good. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Yeah.